Up next, uh, we have Liviu from the uh, Open Sips projects. He's one of the developers. Uh, he's going to talk about distributed user location module or models with Open Sips cluster. All right, let's get this going. Uh, hi everyone, my name is uh, Liviu Kirko. I am a developer for the Open Sips project for six years now, and uh, in the following, we are going to talk about the latest distributed enhancements to the OpenSIPS user location module that have gone into 2.4. Um, uh, a couple words about uh, uh, me and my, uh, where you can contact me. Uh, that, that's the IRC handle, uh, Twitter. And uh, here is a quick uh, run through the, the topics. We will be first looking at the, the state of things, uh, or better said, what motivated us to uh, make these changes. Um, and uh, following from that, uh, the, the way in which we designed the solution, and uh, of course, a few words about the solutions themselves, uh, because there are a uh, few models, as Alex mentioned uh, in the beginning. Uh, and before we go deep into the jungle, let's uh, start things off with a little user location brain teaser. Uh, what is a user location? Uh, apparently, we would be tempted to say it's the location from which uh, users uh, register their phones, right? Alice registers from London to the web service, Bob does it from Amsterdam. Uh, but the IDF people also have in mind this type of user location, the verb. I want to locate the user. So today we are mostly going to be talking about this way of, uh, of the term user location. Here's a legend to make things clearer, right? So user location and user location. So, all right. So getting into, let's look at how uh, things look like. Uh, and uh, what are some real life problems that people have had to solve while building their retail web services all these years. Uh, first off, they had to be distributed. They had to share these registrations across, across multiple locations uh, while presumably uh, avoiding too much, uh, too much replication. Uh, and, but also they have to ensure contact availability in any of these locations. Uh, so another class of problems are uh, those related to IP restrictions. And this is the case uh, often with a lot of cloud instances which have public IPs on them. And uh, for example, in this scenario, Alice is registered on the Seattle pop, but and her state, of course, is replicated to the other pops. But if she receives a call on the Chicago one, that call cannot fly over directly to her. So uh, it won't work due to this IP restriction. So we have to add proper logic to, to the code, uh, to the scripting, whatnot. So we force it, similar to a path mechanism in, in SIG, to uh, egress through Seattle. Uh, Another problem that providers have had to solve um, or deal with uh, are the pinging in order to keep the NAT bindings alive, which is the case when you uh, deal with guest phones. You have to, uh, to keep that registration alive, uh, the, the TCP connection. If you replicate her state to all the pops, all of a sudden, they might start sending options as well. So you have to uh, uh, be, wary, be weary with your flagging logic in order to uh, minimize <coughs> the impact of this problem. Uh, of course, restart persistence issues, making sure that you don't lose uh, a server's data if you restart it or it crashes or not. Uh, high availability. It can be some providers might want it at server level. You can, uh, you can achieve this with uh, this type of setup, active backup, uh, probably uh, uh, 
uh, Rick will have some more to say about this later today. Uh, but you can also, some providers want it at global level. And uh, this is what Rezvan presented yesterday. They might have this type of uh, PGP enabled network that uh, is capable of withstanding a whole pot going down. Uh, and Alice is still uh, unaffected, her uh, user experience stays the same. And uh, so, so these are kind of the, the problems. And let's take a look at what solutions have emerged, what type of patterns we have seen emerging uh, across these years. The first one is uh, what we like to call the federation pattern, or I guess, had to call. Uh, and it's actually a solution that we've also delivered to many of our customers. Uh, basically, uh, the topology is uh, really simple. I'm not sure if uh, you've got the endpoints directly register to the public IPs of each location, and uh, their availability is uh, is being made uh, on each of the, of the remaining locations using a NoSQL database holding metadata records. Uh, there are some, some good <coughs> points to, to this type of solution. It uh, allows you to scale. It uh, solves the natural versal problem. Ding, ding, it looks good. But there is an awful amount of OpenSIP scripting in there. And it's difficult to maintain. Uh, things might change from one version to another. And uh, we thought that we can uh, clearly do better. Uh, another type of pattern is one that is more uh, more uh, layered, so to say. So you have the, the full setup, you have the front end SDC, you have a cluster in the middle, and uh, all the registration data lives in a shared database, and a, a global, uh, most likely noise scale, let's say Cassandra database. And uh, again, this approach uh, takes care of, of all the problems we mentioned earlier because people are using it. Uh, and uh, the problem with this is that you need to have more code in OpenSIP that does this because there is no support to uh, store your registrations into such a database. Uh, and what, so we, we saw the, these things happening and we said, okay, let's, uh, let's clear up things and let's make uh, all the scalability and uh, distribution easy and uh, easy readily available for everyone. And uh, uh, we, we took it in steps. We started having some, uh, some discussions, both on the mailing list, both on IRC, and uh, people weighed in on what, uh, what would be the ideal uh, scripting experience for them and how, uh, how they would like the, their, uh, their logic to work. And also we wanted uh, to keep things simple because no matter if you run your user location as a single instance or if you go with a federated pattern or the full sharing, you shouldn't have to script all that much. In fact, all you're doing is you're still saving a record, a binding. It's, it's that simple. And uh, we wanted, so this was uh, the kind of philosophy we had in mind. And uh, let's take a look at how uh, the, the solutions came together and uh, the way in which the cluster infrastructure uh, made it all possible. Uh, the first one, is a, a full sharing topology. It's a basic kind of a starting point solution. Uh, so here we have a, a full mesh cluster basically. And if you're wondering why I picked six nodes, uh, that's because on Friday, uh, this is what the OpenSIM training people, will, will, students will have to deal with. So it's better to get prepared ahead. Um, yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, so this uh, basic setup, uh, we fully replicate it. It's, it's kind of a fun application of the cluster module. Registration comes in on one server, oh, 
gets fully replicated to everybody. Uh, it's it's a great proof of concept version for uh, for any uh, for you know small to medium sized businesses. And uh, let's take a look at how each problem is solved. Uh, so again, um, regarding the IP restrictions problem. Uh, uh, so let's assume Bob had been registered to the platform through the bar SBC. There's uh, any calls that are uh, heading to the platform through the top one. Make use of that information which is stored in a uniform manner among all nodes. There is no differentiation and it's simply going out to the proper, through the proper SBC. Uh, thinking. We make use of the cluster's ability to be self-aware. So all nodes are, are aware of what the current size of the cluster is, and uh, they are able to distribute the pinging workload. Uh, there will be no extraneous pinging going on. Uh, in this case, uh, it, it's a simple hash function, and uh, they are able to, to achieve this effect. Let's say a node goes down. Uh, the, the pinging workload is spread evenly across, across the remaining nodes. Obviously, they, they might change completely. So, as you as you noticed, from five and six, now they're pinged by one and two. But who cares? It's uh, all very symmetric. Uh, and uh, the last type of problem, the high availability. Again, all the nodes being so symmetric, it's uh, it's a no-brainer. Uh, all the should a node goes go down. Uh, the remaining nodes simply eat up more traffic, and uh, and that's it. Uh, we are able to tolerate even multiple failures without any issues. So, summing up, some pros of this starting type of solution uh, is excellent for small to medium sized businesses, and it's open source only. You don't have to maintain some uh, huge MongoDB cluster, Cassandra. I'm not saying uh, that's a bad thing in itself, but it's uh, even easier to start. What are some cons? Let's see. If, what is the drawback of this? Not, does it not work with that pin holding? Uh, uh, of course, it didn't work. It worked. Where well, you've got different IP addresses pinging back, and you've got a NAT pinhole set up when the registration goes out, would it not be able to send the ping back through it from a different IP? Yeah. So, let's go back to the slide. Okay, so here, right? Uh, so, yeah, oh, that, I, I, I made the, I oversimplified here. <laughs> the the RSVC is here as well. Okay. Yes, sorry. Uh, the options has a, makes use of the route header, path header, just like the invite here does. Oh, okay. So, sorry. An obvious, it's simple, it's an obvious limitation of this full mesh type of replication. When you're doing full mesh, yeah. every time you add a new instance, exactly. you have to go exactly. and it's, all it, it, the existing ones. It won't scale well, so it, is, it, all, it will only take you so far. Um, Why won't it scale? Because it's full mesh, right? What if you have... But what resources get that portion? Okay. Huh? I, I mean, is the network traffic is it going to be too big? Is it going to be too traffic? Is it going to be too big? The, the memory? It, it, it's going to be too much of a brainstorm of, of, of network messages. Anyway, uh, we can take this uh, a step further and share via specialized uh, database. <laughs> We don't have to, to broadcast all the registrations across uh, all of the nodes. So this is the, the taking this solution to, to the next step. Uh, and uh, if you remember earlier, the, the second pattern with the, with the inbuilt driver that people had to do, this is exactly what we did for 2.4. We, we wrote that code such that uh, we are able to, to make use of some uh, capabilities of uh, NoSQL uh, databases in order to store the lists of contacts of an AOR. Um, 
And uh, th th this is uh, how it looks like. Again, the, the layered solution. Uh, and let's take a look at how, uh, how the, again, let's go through the problems and how we solve them. Uh, IP restrictions ki are kind of similar. Again, the data no longer lives in the cluster. It is shifted towards the bottom, kind of a DB only mode. Uh, and uh, all the path headers uh, live in there. Invite arrives to the cluster, we fetch it from the database, and write it out through the proper SBC. The pinging problem, th this, is, uh, this is where it gets a bit interesting. Uh, we can construct uh, queries that uh, only fetch back what nodes each, what contacts each node should ping. So in this case, uh, they periodically do this read. Again, this is not optimized. Uh, we can we can add some sort of matching logic or uh, all sorts of optimizations once we get a feel for how people use this in production and uh, what uh, <coughs> what type of issue or where uh, once we detect the bottlenecks. But for now, we just uh, we just kept it like this. So depending on current size of the cluster, that query will return uh, the, the appropriate pool of uh, subscribers we should pick. And again, this uh, properly adapts to the current number of nodes in the cluster. So we can dynamically, as we grow, right, as we grow the, the middle layer, uh, each node will pay, will ping less and less contacts. Uh, lastly, the high availability is where, uh, it, again, it's, uh, it's all layered. So we can uh, have solutions for, for each. Uh, for example, we may want we may go for some sort of active active setup on the SBCs, but this is not our, our concern because we are uh, only we only are concerned about the data. Uh, with, for the middle, uh, as uh, we can add or lose nodes without affecting the service, and again the database, if we uh, configure it with uh, sorry with uh, the proper uh, values for data replication or uh, sharding we we can achieve again high availability we can tolerate the loss of some nodes so let's put uh, let's draw some conclusions here uh, this helps take things uh, a step further uh, we can scale it even better, and uh, this is meant for the high end. So once you you reach a certain point, you should probably switch to, to this type of solution with uh, with a dedicated storage engine. And uh, I'm talking here about tens of millions. Of I don't know some some cons. I thought it maybe would be worth mentioning. Uh, this is the only question, I guess. Uh, so, with the, with that thinking query, maybe uh, maybe there there will be some some questions around it. But again, we can further optimize it if if it turns out to be a bottle. Okay, let's go into the other pattern, the federated pattern, and uh, let's see the solution that's that we've developed over there. Um, the idea here is that um, we want to keep data locally, local to the pop, and uh, we only want to publish the availability of it inside a shared database. So these records would uh, resemble the following. Uh, they're very likely uh, say uh, this is the AOR and the home ID, it should be routed, uh, uh, further requests should be routed down to. And uh, this helps uh, alleviate the, the IP restriction issues I was mentioning earlier. As uh, Bob's call for Alice arrives in Bob Chicago, we first do this, uh, no skill lookup and we figure out where we should route it out through without actually knowing all of the contact information for Alice. We just want this outbound proxy. 
kind of setting in which we fetch all the data. So with the, with the other with the pings problem, uh, that's pretty easily solved because the data only lives here effectively. So these guys, uh, New York, Chicago. They won't do anything in, like uh, we, we had uh, earlier. And uh, high availability, we uh, built in some logic to allow this as well. And uh, uh, anyway, this is uh, this is specific to how you configure the cluster. I'm not going to get into that, but it also handles this type of setup where, um, for example, uh, let me quickly explain. If uh, these two nodes, the active and backup, replicate data each other, only only to one each other, although all six nodes are part of the same cluster, uh, because they they have they have to know uh, they have to be able to identify the source IP once once traffic is routed to them, uh, and uh, right summing up all of this, I, I guess I kind of ran through this a bit quickly. Uh, this is appropriate for uh, customers which have a simplified network topology. They they want to directly hook the end, the end clients uh, into the uh, <coughs> OpenSIPS the instance. They do not want to, to have that NPC layer that uh, alleviates uh, the NAT traversal problem. Uh, the IP restriction issues, and uh, we solve them with that uh, Abon proxy setting that lives into the noise for database. Uh, it scales well. We can uh, scale each pop individually, add as many nodes, probably balance traffic to them using the uh, DNS rate or something. Um, and uh, as a con, I guess uh, it's worth mentioning, you cannot fail over to another pop. It's pretty obvious. If we yeah, only keep the data in one pop. Should that go down, that data, data center? I guess you you were aware of that since you chose this type of setup. And uh, let's let's look at how old this is used. As I was mentioning earlier, we aim aim for simplicity. So we added this working mode preset to the user location and this is all you need to do. You switch it to full sharing and uh, throw the cluster in there and just provision the nodes and it will run into, into this mode. Uh, if you want to, to go with the cachedb based, uh, just plug in the cachedb URL, change the preset to the full sharing with the database and, and that's it, you're good to go again. Uh, I guess the last one, the, the federation, also requires an additional type of lookup. Uh, maybe I should put in an extra slide here. So lookup has a has a G flag, global flag. So you can either do a local lookup to a node, or you can go to that uh, into the metadata storage and append branches uh, going to all other pods. So a bit of scripting. It's it's a few lines. Uh, we're going to cover that on Friday's training. Um, but that's pretty much it. Again, very uh, intuitive way of uh, putting all of this together. Um, and uh, for uh, as for the future plans, we I'm going to admit that I didn't manage to also update the Cassandra driver. So we currently only have the MongoDB driver available, but this is definitely going to be in there. Uh, we're probably going to backward it to 2.4. Uh, the Cassandra driver support because it, it is a widely used database and uh, I, maybe I, I would say that it's more preferred than Mongo. <coughs> everyone agrees, but uh, uh, Mongo was easier as a proof of concept, at least in, in my case. So we, we we went with that. So this will definitely be up soon, and uh, maybe although a bit of a long shot. Maybe we will consider uh, enhancing the API tools to support uh, Redis. I don't know about Crunchbase. We'll, we'll see. Um, uh, we, I really feel the need to give some proper credits to the people, the members of the community who contributed for, for all of this. 
Uh, first, there's Vlad over there in the back who uh, actually wrote the, the first uh, type of federated OpenSIP script. There's Eric Tani who uh, not only got involved in the public discussions, uh, but also helped me out with uh, one of his white papers with uh, some tips regarding to these type of setups. And, uh, and others, Jared, Adrian, Mohammed, David, and Rudy, who all, all joined into the discussion and uh, helped shape all of this, uh, all of this feature. And uh, yeah, as a takeaway message, it's uh, the, the new enhanced user location is distributed. It's complex and complete, but it's so easy to use. If you, if you have any questions. Do we have any questions for Louis? So in the uh, federated plus cache DB mode, where you basically have a global store of smaller metadata set, yes. what's the significant advantage of that versus doing um, I can't remember what, the, what you call it, but basically like they the no SQL back right. entry had a complete data set um, because you you have to keep what's effectively a path header. Uh, this is the Galvan proxy, right. And, and the information, yeah. Anyways, I'll let you answer. Okay, so the question is, why did we go for the, why is the federated setup even necessary in the first place, whereas we could have gone with uh, full storage into, into no SQL? Um, well, the idea is that you you have to to exit through through some specific uh, node, right? And uh, in the first case, you don't have the, the SPC letter. You just have to go through through that initial proxy, that, that initial instance. All right. It, yeah, I guess if, if you're using a path there, though, that gets you the same thing. So if you're storing the registration with the path. Um, like on say, or rather, I can see a pen path for the registrar and say, so you get the path there. So when you do a look up, you get the, or say it's on the, yeah, uh, a wrap header then at that, at that point, yeah, which gets you out the same way. Um, I like the idea of the global versus local and being able to do that look up. I'm just curious why bother, why not sort of the registration <laughs> versus just a smaller main data set? Um, it's, it's kind of a balanced solution, right? So we uh, maybe there's less data into the, the SQL database. You get yeah, uh, you get better a better way of or, or uh, you, it's just an option. Basically. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No. No. I'm, it's, I'm not being it's critical. I'm lighter sure record. No. Right. Critical. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> no. I, I was just sure if there was something specific that uh, that was like, wow, this is a huge performance trade off, and we really. Have <laughs> go that way, or if it was just like, well, maybe we'll try this because it seems faster later, we'll see how it works. It, it's kind of, kind of like that, give, give people some options and we'll see what takes off. Okay. That, that was the idea. Yeah, I, I, like, I like the global versus local uh, idea, and it's very similar to what we do. Um, that's why I like it, no, I'm just kidding. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, no, it's great, thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Further questions, okay, hold on. Um, in the full sharing mode, um, how do you define which nodes will be pinging uh, <coughs> the user agents? And if you are in sort of tagging or um, flag. Okay, uh, I, I got the question. So the how, question how, is just if, uh, one more thing. What, what happens if that node goes down? Who yes. takes over that? Takes over. Okay. So the question is in full sharing mode, so when you have that. Full, uh, fully meshed cluster. Uh, how does the pinging work exactly? Uh, well, it's just a module function of the current number of nodes. Say we just hash the AOR, we throw that as an index into the, the database. Oh, wait, wait, now I mean, so let's just, just go with the non database setup because it, it's easier to, to explain. Um, and we just do this module operation, right? Module current number of nodes. So hash of the AUR, 
Yeah. Odds on current number of nodes, that gives me the subset of contacts I should be in right now. And that automatically self adapts to how many nodes are there currently in the cluster. That's <coughs> it's math. Did that answer? Did that answer your question? Yes. Because I can keep them here for a while if you need me to. Got one in the back here. Okay. Kind of, kind of expanding on on the last question. I just wanted to, you know, when when you're set, you're setting the flag for the pinging, is it? Are you setting a different flag for each proxy, and that's how it's it's triggering only for that one proxy, or is there other methods automated? Uh, no, there, there's no flag. There's no pinging flag going on. If you, I mean, I guess you can enable it globally if you want that contact to be pinged. Of course, there's going to be a flag, but it doesn't uh, pinpoint to some specific node. So it's not node specific flagging. It's contact ping flagging because the, the distribution of pings is entirely uh, up to the internal logic. Yeah, it's just how that number works now, where it just grabs chunks of exactly. contacts to ping and then it's relying on the SBC layer to avoid the, the natural person problem. Yep. You're having people do the work for you. <laughs> we have another question right here, and I think we're going to have to make this our last question because we are falling a little behind. Uh, I'm being testing this, and uh, it's great so what the work you've been doing on it. Uh, there is one issue I, I hit, which I, I did notify you, but I yes. thought it was worth mentioning. I don't know if it's been sorted yet. If you're uh, firing an event uh, from the news log yes. module to say that a new AOR has been created, okay. I was finding that there was no way of uh, knowing if it was the primary node or if it was one where the data had been replicated. But they were, they were, it was firing on all the nodes. Okay. Yeah, no way of knowing which. Okay. Well, that's the like the message. I got it, I got it. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Okay, so the, the question, or better said, the, the comment was that uh, currently, when an AOR is created within the cluster, you get the script event both for the original node and on all the nodes you've received the replicated event. So I guess. Uh, uh, it's not as if we need to fix that, but rather we need to add some way of indicating, of indicating if it's a replicated type of event or a direct uh, user agent or event. Yeah. Well, we haven't done that yet. <laughs> so. Okay, no more questions. Get off the stage. <laughs> Thank you.